Last time we talked about how to represent polyhedral schedules in a computer. This time I want to talk a little bit about how to generate code from polyhedral schedules once you've done some transformations and produce the schedule you actually want. So last time we learned how to create a schedule that represents a loop nest. So we took in a loop nest like the one over here or a sequence of loop nests like the one over here and we produced uh, schedules that map statements in the original program to times that correspond to the execution trace of this program. So now let's suppose we transform this uh, schedule. So we start operating on the schedule that we have, and we do that by reversing i and j. So we swap the i and j components of uh, the times when p, when statement p is executed. Now intuitively we know that this operation reverses the i and j loops. So whereas before we had the statement pij surrounded by for i and 1 to 4, for j and 1 to 3, when we swap the looped index variables, we should get for j in 1 to 3, for i in 1 to 4, blah, blah, blah. But now that we've done this transformation, if we didn't already know a priori that uh, we had gotten this from some other loop nest, and we couldn't just do a syntax transformation of that loop nest to get back to what we want, how would we turn this schedule into the loop nests that uh, uh, it represents? Um, and how do we turn the intuition about how to generate this kind of loop nest into an algorithm to generate code? So the first step is to think of a very simple template for the code generation. So let's imagine that all of our code generation for these loop nests <coughs> is going to just iterate over every single time in the output space doing operations for their schedule. So the output space for each of these statements is three dimensions which means we're going to have three loop nests with loop index variables, let's call them t1, t2, and t3. And we're going to have for t1 in some bounds, for t2 in some bounds, for t3 in some bounds, so basically iterating over every single point in this three-dimensional space. If an operation is scheduled at time t1, t2, t3, then do that operation. So the first step is to elaborate. So basically we're going to say for you know t1 and blah, for t2 and blah, for t3 and blah, if statement p is scheduled at that timestamp, execute it, and if statement c is scheduled at that timestamp, execute it. The next step is to fill in the loop bounds by computing the min and max value of each t variable. So if we look back over at the schedule, if we just project away all the other components, components 2 and 3 of the output space, and we just look at component 1 and ask what's the minimum value that that component has and the maximum value that it has. And by minimum and maximum, I mean the minimum and maximum value at which some instance of a statement is scheduled. So pi is scheduled at time 1, c is scheduled at time 1, and so the min of t1 is 0, the max will be 1. For t2, if we just isolate and look at the middle component, the, uh, pi, pij is scheduled for time j, for j between 1 and 3, so the min is 1 and the max is 3, but then actually uh, cm is scheduled for uh, time component 2, at where for every instance of time component 2 between 1 and 4. So the min is 1 and the max is 4. So we'll say for, two, for t2 and 1 to 4. And then a similar procedure will tell us that, for example, for i um, in the third component, pij is scheduled at time i, where i is between 1 and 4. So the min is 1 and the max is 4. But then actually we have to extend that because cm is scheduled at time 0 in component 3. So t3 will range from time 0 to time 4. Next, we reconstruct the original loop index variables from the new schedule value variable from the new schedule variables. So, for example, and I'm being a little bit uh, casual here. There are uh, more principled ways to do this through uh, basically integer programming operations on this uh, set representation. But I don't want to go over the details of that now. Let's just use our intuition to construct these. So, the variable cm is mapped to time, or the statement instance cm is mapped to time t1, t2, t3, which means that m should just be equal to t2. And then uh, j is mapped to time component t2, so we'll say j equals t2, i equals t3, and then we'll say if p is scheduled at time t1, t2, t3, then we'll do pij. If c is scheduled at time t1, t2, t3, we'll do cm. Now we flesh out the conditions for the execution statement of the statements. So pij is only ever executed when t0 is 0, so it must be guarded by, t or by when t1 is 0, so it must be guarded by a t1 equal to 0. And then it's also only executed when j or t2 is between 1 and 3, and when i or t2 is between 1 and 4, or excuse me, i and t3, sorry. Um, and then similarly, cm is scheduled for timestamp 1m0, which means that t1 must be equal to 1, 1 must be less than or equal to m, and less than or equal to 4, and then t3 must be equal to 0. And this is our final code. 
Now you might have noticed that this code doesn't look like what a human would write. If you carefully check it, you'll find that this does actually represent the same execution order that we talked about earlier on with the permuted loop nests, but it doesn't look anything like the kind of idiomatic uh, C or C++ code that you might see a human programmer write. And to make matters worse, it includes a lot of wasted loop iterations. So if you look at this uh, schedule, PIJ happens for every value of i between 1 and 4 inclusive and j between 1 and 3 inclusive, which is 12. And CM happens for every value of m between 1 and 4, which is 4. So in total, there are only 16 statement instances that will happen in the execution of this program. But if you look at this loop nest, there's 2 times 5 times, or excuse me, 2 times 4 times 5, I'm sorry, which is equal to 40 loop iterations. So there are 24 loop iterations where we go over the loop, we execute both of these conditions, they both turn out to be false and we do nothing. And so even though maybe in principle we wanted this schedule uh, because it was better for some reason, maybe better locality or you know, better cache properties or something like that, uh, it actually, the code that's generated is horrendously inefficient. And this is one of the problems you have to watch out for in the polyhedral model, which is that even when you create a mathematical representation of exactly the schedule you want, code generation and turning that schedule into a loop nest you'd actually want to execute can be very, very tricky. So can we do a better job of doing code generation? That's a very tricky question, and it's one that I'm going to address next time, and it's one of the big areas of research in the polyhedral model historically. How do you turn these nice uh, polyhedral schedule representations into code you'd actually want to execute? So if you want to hear more about that, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.